think. I think we live in a messed up world. I don't know if you agree with me or not. Every time I turn around, there's something that doesn't make sense to me. And uh, I did a study a while back, and you guys probably remember a book that I read called The Jesus Creed. I talked about it a lot during that time. And so this, again, is some, some thoughts that I had while I was reading that book, uh, some thoughts that uh, Scott McKnight, who wrote the book, I'm going to use some of his points in here as well, uh, just because I feel like this is the key as to why we're in such a messed up world. And we're in such a messed up world because I'm a messed up person. You're a messed up person. And I think we've lost perspective on what God's true love is. And, and the more, um, I guess, maybe you don't need to be reminded of it, I just know that I need to be reminded of it. Because I don't think I love people. I don't think I love God um, to the full extent that I could. And so that, that's what today is going to be about. Then we're going to um, talk a little bit about God's love and how we need to, to think, to uh, talk, I mean, discuss that, think about that. Um, I just feel like our morals over time um, have deteriorated. Uh, you know, things that happened 100 years ago, not that I'm 100 years old, but things that happened uh, 50 years ago, I am over 50. Um, you know, we've seen a transgression of the world um, becoming more and more immoral and, and having uh, a moral viewpoint uh, the way God wants us to has become uh, narrow-minded and the world looks down on us for having that viewpoint. And, and that's sad. Um, but this is the world that we live in. And so, again, this is why I, need, why I need to be reminded, and I want to remind you. So let's go all the way back. If you have your Bibles with you, we want to go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Um, that's in the Old Testament. And, um, and also, by the way, welcome to those of you online. We're glad you're here. Um, but we're going to be having communion, like, right at the end of the sermon. So if you want to get your stuff together for that time, um, we'll lead right in from the end of the sermon into communion here. Um, but Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9, says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today, these words that I command you today shall be on your hearts. Now let me pause here for a moment to say, not only on your hearts, but look what follows after this. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and you shall be as, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I think what the emphasis of that verse means that that's pretty important, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your might. And so let me ask you this morning is as you kind of go through life, as you go to work or as you hang out with your friends, do your friends ever just say to you, wow, you're a person who really loves the Lord? I don't get that said about me very often, and that's probably not a good thing. Maybe you do, I don't. But look at how strong this command is, and, and yet we, we probably don't have people thinking about us that way, which is sad, and I think we really should. Well, God went on a little bit further in Leviticus, flip over to Leviticus 19, and he gives us some practical advice about how this plays out, okay? So Leviticus 19, verse 9 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not recap, no, I'm sorry, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. Okay, now I know you're thinking, I'm not a farmer, what does this have to do with me? So hang on, you'll get to, we'll get to it, all right? Verse 10, And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard, you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal. You shall not deal falsely. You shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely. And so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbors or rob them. The wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put, stumbling put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall not do injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. All this God has given practical advice 
to say this one phrase that we know very well, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. I really do think this is the heart of the issue of not only moral decline of our society, but us individually, that we really aren't um, loving our neighbors the way God wants us to. Back in the Old Testament, again, as the people were taken from Israel into captive for Babylon, um, that was part of the punishment that God, or the reason for the punishment was because uh, they, they did not take care of the poor. They did not take care of those uh, that were down in society. Uh, they they push, pushed them to the side and went on with their life. And so whenever I get a chance to talk about this, I do. You probably have heard me, those of you that know me many times. Um, if we wear the name of Christian, which we do, that's why we're sitting here, right? We are Christians, um, then we need to be reminded of this. And um, I think this word love is just thrown around way too easily in our culture. Uh, for instance, we only have one word for love. I love my wife. I hope you all know that. Um, I love my children, and I really love my grandchildren, right? <laughs> but I also love basketball, and I loved Oreos, especially the mega stuffed ones. And I love Dot's Lemon Meringue Pie, but that was another sermon a while back, right? So you all know that. I won't go there today. So in English, we just have this one word for love. I think my wife's pretty, um, I don't know, guarded that I don't love her the way I love my Oreo cookies, right? I love her differently. That love is totally different. I know my grandsons have done that. I've already, you know, tried to trade them off for Oreo cookies, and it hasn't worked out so well with them. But, uh, but the point is, within English, we get the word very confused with love because we use it in so many different ways. It is just so watered down. In Hebrew, there was basically three or four different words that they would use for love um, according to the situation and the circumstances. And here in this passage that I just read, these two passages, uh, that word for love is called ahava. We're going to learn two, two Hebrew words today uh, that I think are important. So this word is ahava. That's the word for love. Now this week, I knew I was preaching on this. I was working on the sermon. Um, I have a, uh, emails that I get every so often from a Messianic Jewish organization, and they talked about this subject. And I thought, like, what a coincidence, right? Um, or a God incidence, as one person told me one time, that it really helped. Because I want to read to you what they say about this word love here. They said this, to understand love is to understand it as loyalty. They say that word ahava, instead of being translated love, should be translated loyalty. So in Deuteronomy 6.5, it should be loyalty and not love. We need to read the verse in the context of what come right before, right before it. And this is called to the Jewish people the Shema. I guess you're going to learn three Hebrew words. Okay, the Shema. So most English translations of Deuteronomy 6.4 read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, which is the word echad, although you have to do a little phlegm thing in there that I'm not going to do. Echad, all right? So while the Hebrew word echad means one, as in there was evening, there was morning, day one in Genesis 1.5, echad could also mean alone. So therefore, a stronger translation of Deuteronomy 6.4 is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. That's pretty strong, the Lord alone. That is, the Lord is Israel's God, and the people of Israel must not go after other gods. They must love or be loyal to the Lord alone. And then they said, the loyalty that we have for, for the God of Israel to the exclusion of all other gods extends to our fellow human beings, particularly those who are less familiar to us. Leviticus uses this exact same word for loyalty to God in the command to love a stranger. It says, you shall treat the stranger who dwells with you as the native among you, and you shall love Ahava, you shall love him as yourself. It's Leviticus 19.34. When it comes to the heavenly realm, we are to be loyal to God alone. But when we are here on earth, God commands us to pledge that same loyalty to those around us. To me, that's very precise and very strong, and I, and I really, really like that. And so we need to think about those, those things. We have people all around us, and again, are they looking at us and saying, now there's a person that loves the Lord God alone? So I'm guessing that we have somebody at least here saying, okay, Steve, but you've only been talking about the Old Testament, and we're a New Testament church, uh, so those things of the Old Testament don't fly. Um, that's another sermon another day, or my Sunday school class that I teach at 9 o'clock over there. Uh, we're talking a lot about that. Um, but Mike has been talking a lot lately about making disciples, right? You've heard that in almost every sermon. He talks about making disciples. 
And making a disciple is, is latching on to the teachings, but also the example of Jesus Christ. We are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. We put it on the wall, a growing community becoming like Christ. Individually, we're disciples. As a community, we are a church of disciples. And so, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says this, in Mark 12, 29. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord alone. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. But the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. See where I say that there's a command here that we take too lightly, I think, in our lives. Um, and again, I, I can't say this enough. Don't think that I'm just talking about everybody that I'm looking at and everybody's speaking to. Um, it's something that I need to be reminded of and work harder on all the time too. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit later. And so what does God's love or God's loyalty look like? And so this morning, I'm going to just give you a few things. Um, if you have your notes with you, um, there's also some notes back on the table there. Um, but we're going to see God's love in action. But let me warn you, and this is the first thing on your notes, because I think this is what we realize, is that love is a great idea and a wonderful vision until we realize how challenging it really is. And so listen to me all throughout this as we go. First of all, point number one, love is a rugged commitment. <clears throat> in Genesis 15, we we hear, we read about a great story about how God chose this one man named Abram, later his name is Abraham, but chose this one man to father a nation. And Abram and his wife were old. Um, God said that he was going to build a nation through them, and they thought this is really weird because we're too old. But Abraham believed and trusted God, the, the scriptures say that, but still he wanted a sign. And so God did something very strange to us when we read it, but it wasn't strange to Abraham. He, he told Abraham to go get a heifer, a goat, and a ram, all of them three years old, and then to get a pigeon and a dove. And then he said, cut them in half, and he cut them in half, and then separate them. So there's a path between them. They didn't cut the birds by chance. I don't know why that is. But anyway, but there's a path between them. That sounds really strange, right? Can you imagine that if um, President Biden and President Putin today talk again, and they come to an understanding, and we get home from church, and we turn on the news and we see Putin and Biden walking hand to hand through the halves of heifers and goats and rams. That'd be really weird, right? But that's what kings did back in the day of Abraham. When a king made a truce with another king, then that's what they would do. They would do that. Not, not for gross out reasons. Um, I'm sure they probably cooked the, the, the meat afterwards. Um, but the point is, is this, is this is the point, what God is saying to Abraham. You can split me in half if I'm not faithful to the terms of this covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham that I'm going to build a nation through you, and I don't care how old you are. You could be even 100 years more older than you are at this time, um, but I'm still going to do it, and that God was going to be faithful to these people throughout. That's a commitment, right? That when you can say you can split me in half if I don't um, agree with this, this commitment. Um, as I was thinking about that and writing this, this might be too cruel to say, um, but wouldn't it be cool if we did that in our marriage vows? Kind of funny, but that's a pretty strong commitment, right? Anyway, okay, I'll let that just settle there. We won't, we won't talk about that. That kind of hurts sometimes. Um, but anyway, over the next hundreds of years, God was faithful to, to Israel. Israel was not faithful to God. God never abandoned them. God continued to discipline them. He continued to judge them. He continued to do things to try to bring them back to Him. And from time to time they did, uh, but they kept falling away, and He'd have to judge them again. But He always kept a remnant. He was always faithful, loyal to that covenant that he made with Abraham, which he is today even. So we start to begin to understand then love begins with God, and it begins with this rugged commitment, and it's to put one person's life in front of another. If you don't agree with the covenant, you're willing to split yourself open for that person. That's a pretty big graphic image there. Number two, love is effective, not effective, but effective, which is emotional. I hear people say from time to time that, you know, love's a commitment, love's a, a contract or whatever, that you love them even though you're not emotional anymore. Well, that goes against everything that we look at, really, right? When you love someone or something, you have a lot of passion about that, and, and um, you have a lot of emotion usually. And, usually. and when you think about this, too, that when, when Jesus' um, friend Lazarus died, uh, Jesus went to Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha, and Jesus knew that he was going to raise him from the dead. I mean, we don't know that, but it's pretty obvious that that's what he was going to do. 
And yet when he saw Mary and Martha, what did he do? The Bible said he wept. You know, love is emotional. He loved Mary and Martha. And, and they were hurting. And because he loved for them and they were hurting, it said that he wept. He showed emotion over that. Later, we call it the Olivet Discourse, where, where Jesus is with his disciples and they're close to the temple. They're in that area. And Jesus is full of sorrow because he says there's going to be a time when all these stones will be laid bare, where, where all this will be destroyed. And he's thinking back about how this all started with a tabernacle and God met with his people there. And, and then they built a temple and God met with his people there. And they had all these sacrifices and it was such a way of life. But, but yet he knew there's a better way of life. We're going to talk about that at the end of the sermon. Uh, but at the same time, he had sorrow for this beautiful temple, uh, this, this beautiful system that God made in order for people to be close to him uh, was going to be totally destroyed. And so love is an emotion. Scott Maniah in his book says uh, that we must, um, oh, that this is a must read for all Christians, I said, but he says this, the love God had for Abraham and for his descendants was a head over heels swooning over the beauty of humans, the beauty of their relationship with God, and the beauty of their life together. Love at least, God's love, is emotional, it's effective, it's rugged, and it's, it's that rugged commitment. Okay, so not only that, point number three, love is present. Love is presence, okay? This might be the hardest part of love that I have. Maybe you do as well. Um, but God not only had a rugged emotional commitment uh, to his people, but he promised to be with them. And as we read through the scriptures, we see that time and time again. When the, when the Israelites left Egypt, God was with them in a cloud by day and a fire by night to guide them through the wilderness. Uh, when he was in the tabernacle, when Moses went to meet with God, God was there in the tabernacle. It said above the, the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, God met with Moses there. He was there with him. The people knew that God was there. When Jesus on that Christmas morning was born, the angel said, this is Emmanuel, God with us. So, so he, he came to earth to be with us. And then probably the, one of the most important verses to us to know um, well, no, when Jesus left and after he died and he, and he was resurrected, uh, he didn't leave us alone. He sent the Holy Spirit to us, and we still have the Holy Spirit with us even today. We are not alone. And then this is what I wanted to get to, Revelation 21, 3 through 4 says, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. I didn't need to read that second part in that, but I really like that. Uh, but the first part is, God comes to be with his people, and we will be with God through all of eternity when that time of heaven comes. So love is rugged, it's effective, it's present, and when we understand that, we start to realize that's where the challenge begins. When we say we love someone, when we understand the command that God gives us to love our neighbor, then we have no choice, but we need to be present in their lives. And so it's not about, let's send the preacher over to talk to them. I have a neighbor that's kind of messy, and I don't want to deal with them, so let's send the preacher over. Or there's a nation over there that they're kind of messy, and I don't want to uproot myself from my life, so let's send a missionary over. Um, or, you know, maybe it's like, you know what, I don't want to personally deal with this, but God's blessed me, I'll send money, I'll let somebody else deal with this. Um, that's not the love that God's talking about. We must be present. We must be present. It involves getting, in, it, love is being involved in their life. You know, maybe it's as simple as taking your neighbor for a cup of coffee and just sitting down and chat with them. But again, I warn you, when you get into people's lives, you discover their lives are messy. Now, you may not know me very well, but if you sit down with me for a cup of coffee, you're probably going to leave saying, you know what, his life is pretty messy. Uh, that's the way everybody is, but we got to make a commitment to, to be that way. And that leads us to point number four, is that love is advocacy. Love is advocacy. So when God says, I am who I am, <clears throat> excuse me, when he says, I am your God and you are my people, excuse me, today we have this phrase, I got your back. We understand that, right? I got your back. And that's what God is saying when he says that, I am who I am. Or he says, I am your God, you are, my you are my people, he's got our back. Whenever we're up against temptation and we can barely stand it, God has our back. If we would open up our spiritual eyes, open up ourselves to God, we would understand that he has promised a way out. 
God, is our, God is, has our back. He is an advocate for us, and we need to be that for other people as well. James 1.27 says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God, the Father, is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Again, we're being compromised more and more and more by our culture, and we are loving people less and less in our culture. Christians should not ignore the poor or the oppressed or people that have been, life has really dealt them a really, really bad hand. We need to find those people, and we need to be advocates for them. We sang a, ver, or sang a song, in the ver, I think it was the very first song we sang. It said, it doesn't matter what addictions or what troubles or what difficulties you've gone through. God is there for us. We need to be that same type of people for our neighbors as well, the people that God puts in front of us. So when we love someone, um, from then on, uh, we need to have their back. We need to advocate for them uh, when we can. Um, and so that's why at Bay Area, at least, we partner with places like Galveston Urban Ministries, Interfaith Caring Ministries, Anchor Point, uh, just to name a few. We have missionaries that we support. Um, and I know the way I said that before, I'm saying, well, why did you, do, you know, why do we do that if we're sending money to them? Well, because, you know, we're not going to them, <laughs> okay? That, that is, all that stuff is a good means, but, but we need to be present in those places as well. We need to have a presence. In fact, we have one that comes here to our building called Family Promise. Once a quarter for a week, they come to our building, and it's people who are really, most of them are dealt a bad hand. Sure, they've made some mistakes on their own, but haven't we all? And they're homeless temporarily. They're, they're just a couple paychecks away from being able to get back on their feet and go. And, and, and Family Promise is a great organization. And Monica, der, Monica sits over here. Anyway, Monica, she's going to hate me for saying this, but she's in charge of that. She's, she organizes that for us. And she does a great job. And she knows them because she's present. Even when she's not on duty that day um, to, to spend the night or eat supper, she still drops in and she sits down and, and eats with them and talks to them. Um, that many of you have done that as well. And what we find out is what? What I've been warning you, their lives are messy, right? Their lives are messy, but, but just by being there and, and getting to know them and having a conversation with them makes all the difference in the world. So these are great organizations. They all share God's love with, with the poor, the people that need a voice in our society. And we do need to support them, but we need to not use the example of sending our money, sending our spouses or whoever might be other people. Uh, we need to take care of ourselves. But more importantly, what I keep coming back to is it's our neighbors. It's the people that we live close to, the people that our kids go to school with, the parents of them, and the people like that. Uh, we need, we need to, to um, be advocates. We need to love them. Uh, Deb and I, I have time to say this. Um, you know, I hate to admit this, but we tried foster care. It didn't go well for us. Um, you know, we learned a lot, and we learned that it is very messy being a part of um, not only their lives, but being a part of a government's lives, of, of the government having programs for these people that it doesn't seem to help them very much. And it became very frustrating for us, and, and so we're not doing that, and we're still looking for ways uh, to, to help. Our heart goes out to young people whose parents um, are just not doing a good job of taking care of them if they're doing that at all. Um, and there's so many young people out there, and so we're still looking for ways uh, that we can help in that, that area. Um, and, and so I don't know what God has placed on your heart, as I'm trying to get at is, you know, but don't ignore it. Um, maybe it doesn't work out, but that doesn't mean that you just throw it away. Uh, look for other avenues. Continue to pray, and God will, God will help you with that, because that leads to the last point here, is that love has direction. If we understand all of these points that I've set up to this point, we'll understand that, that this love, this loyalty that we have for our neighbor, this rugged commitment, effective, present, all of this demands advocacy uh, for people that need help, for people that uh, don't have a voice in this world, that we can speak for them or we can uh, give aid to them, we can help them. And we do all that because Jesus told us to. And our job as a disciple is to be more like Jesus every day. And if we would do that, if we would speak into a person's life, if we do all these things that we've talked about, um, advocating for them, um, then they would realize what a Christian truly is. Could you imagine if people, I'll say this, um, came into our church that we didn't know and they were messy? You know, we don't have very many of those people coming into our church. We have some, and there's a lot of you. Like I said, my life is messy, your life is messy. We all need help. That's why God created the church to come together to help one another. But sometimes we're so prideful and we're so much saying, let's just come and be fed the word and get out of here that we don't realize we need to be present 
We need to be present. We should know everybody's name in this room. You should, you should have gone to lunch with them or something with them, everybody in this room. That's what our church should be doing. That's, that's maybe step one, is take somebody to lunch that you don't know their name. Go up and ask them what it is. But we need to understand, we need to, we need to be involved in that. If we're a child of God, this is not optional. This is a command. And let me remind you again, it's a command from Jesus. Mark 12 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no commandment greater than these. So let's finish with this. Three challenges. If they're in your notes, you're going to have to write them really quick. But it's very important. Turn enemies into neighbors. Do you have any enemies? Turn them into neighbors. Turn those that we don't like into people that we do like. I remember when Deb and I were dating, this guy came up, we were in college, I believe, but this guy came up and talked to me, and I was real nice to him, and he turned around and went away, and I turned around, and I just go like, what an idiot. <laughs> I, remember, I remember saying that because that blew Deb away. She goes, how could you be so nice to him and then turn around and say, what an idiot? Well, I had a lot of growing to do, didn't I? Um, hopefully, I don't do that anymore today. But at times, people are still idiots. It doesn't matter, right? God tells me I have to love them, all right? Third, turn enemies into neighbors. Turn those we don't like into those we do like. And third, turn people who are invisible in our society into bright visibility. I think that's our biggest goal as Christians. Turn people who are invisible in our society into bright visibility. That's my challenge to everyone here today. Francis Schaeffer said this, love and the unity it attests to is the mark Christ gave Christians to wear before the world. Only when this mark, only with this mark, may the world know that Christians are indeed Christians and that Jesus was sent by the Father. I'm going to ask the band to come forward, and I wanted to finish with communion. We're going to be taking communion in just a moment. But I want to finish with this time because I've talked a lot about the Old Testament, and I mentioned briefly about Jesus giving us this command. Um, but man, it is, it is so, so true. God didn't have to do what he, what he did in order for us to be with him. And when we understand this, how generous God really is, I talked about that Christmas day, Jesus was born, how, how humble he was born in a manger. And yet his name is Emmanuel, God with us. And God continued to try to get the attention of the Jewish people, and they continued to fail God. They continued to not see it. So they rejected Jesus the Messiah. And unfortunately, and fortunately, we celebrate that very act. That sounds really weird, right? Because the Jews rejected the Messiah, we now celebrate this, that Messiah because, because of the rejection. Jesus was crucified on the cross. He died for our sins. We now know that. I know this sounds weird to celebrate it, but the fact is he died for our, our sins because God sent his one and only son that whoever believes on him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. Jesus loved us so much that he stayed on that cross until death because he knew that his father loved him so much that he wouldn't stay dead. Jesus had victory over death. He came back to life. The father raised him from the dead. And now we know through all of that that our sins can be forgiven. God made a way for us to live everlasting life in face-to-face -face with him. So this morning we take juice and we take bread and we do that to remember that very sacrifice I just described. How much love did God have for us that, that Jesus would die on the cross. In fact, Jesus said at the Last Supper before his death, the Last Supper he had with his disciples, that he took the bread and he showed it to them. It wasn't a little wafer like we have here. It was a loaf of bread. And he broke it and he passed it around. And he said, remember me, because physically what I'm about to go through is going to be really, really tough. I'm paraphrasing now. It's going to be hard for you to understand but remember when you break this bread, what it's going to show. I will fast forward you to those that walked on the road to Emmaus. They saw Jesus when they broke the bread with Jesus. He's telling the disciples, this is my body. I'm going to shed it for you. When you eat that, do it in remembrance of me. And then he took the juice, the fruit of the vine. And he said, as you take this, remember... Again, my death on the cross and the blood that I shed because that was the sacrificial system that God set up 
to cover the sins of the world. But it only covered the sins of the world until Jesus did that ultimate sacrifice and all the sins, sins past, sins at that moment, and sins future, for those who call on the name of the Lord, who accept the gospel message, Jesus died on that cross, his blood shed for our final sacrifice of our sins being forgiven. As we drink it, we remember the new covenant that he established for us to have everlasting life with God. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, it's amazing how much you love us. We just take it for granted so much. And even the people that you create that are around us, the ones that you love around us, you command us to love them as well. Lord, I just pray that our eyes, our ears are open, our minds are, are willing to accept this message, and that as we leave this building, we don't forget about it, but we look around and open our spiritual eyes and see those people that you love, that life has handed them a really, really bad way. Help us, Lord, to see that and to step in and to love them the way that you love us. Lord, we just again praise you for that. We don't take, we don't take it for granted. We're reminded and reminded and reminded how much you love us. And love comes at a cost. And we just thank you, Lord, for loving us, for calling us to be in your family, in your kingdom. And we look forward to that day as we read in Revelation about being with you face to face for everlasting time. Thank you, Lord, for everyone that's here today. Bless them. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to finish with a couple songs. Um, I'd like the prayer partners, if you would, just go to the back of the room, and, and I'll be back there too. Um, but I really do mean that about what our job is as a Christian. Take our enemies and, and to love them. And I may say that to somebody, and right there, you, you tense up. I can't love that person. Maybe you've got somebody on your mind right now. I, I just can't love them then I would invite you just to go back to a prayer partner and have them pray for you. That's the start of it. It doesn't happen easily. Nothing I've said today is easy. I'm not, I'm not saying that it's all hard, um, but it's something that can be done for us. Maybe you don't love God the way you think you should love God. Maybe you don't love God the way He loves you, or you don't understand how God could love you. Then go back with a prayer partner and start with prayer. Um, but also, if you want to talk more about that, contact me, contact Mike. Um, contact Kyle at the, after the end of this month because he's on sabbatical right now. Um, but, but we would love to talk to you because God loves you so much. And, um, you know, we're, we're here to affect lives of other people for God, and we need to be Christ-like in order to do that. So while these next two songs go on, um, if you want prayer, go back to our prayer partners. <laughs>